One of the things I've tried to emphasize to you in these videos is that we are modeling circuits. That means we're trying to come up with mathematical descriptions that reasonably match physical reality. Unfortunately, it also means that some of the pieces we put together create physical absurdities. For example, up till now, all the sources we have used have been ideal. An ideal voltage source outputs the same voltage no matter how much current we're drawing from it. Experience tells us that this is not true. In our homes, if we switch on something that draws a lot of current, very often, the lights will flicker. Or if we try to start our car while the headlights are on, the headlights dim. The actual physical reason for these two occurrences is slightly different, however, we can model both of these in the same way. For our purposes, when dealing with circuits on an introductory level, we might evaluate our models by asking two questions. How well do they predict the results that we get? And how easy are they to use? An ideal voltage or current source is very easy to use, but it does not have great predictive power. This flaw in the model is very easily corrected. For example, we can model a voltage source more accurately simply by adding a series resistance with the ideal source. To see if this improves our model of a voltage source, we can investigate how the output voltage of the source will change based on how much current a load resistor is trying to draw. The voltage at the output can be calculated using simple voltage division. If we start looking at the output voltage, or looking at a fairly large load resistor, for example, one kilo ohm, we find the output voltage is nearly 12 volts. And I do ask you to forgive me a little for playing loose with significant figures for this illustration. If we decrease the load resistance to 10 ohms, we find the output voltage decreases by just slightly more than a tenth of a volt. A load resistor of 1 ohm results in the output being slightly more than a volt below the ideal. When our load resistance matches the resistance of the source, we get exactly half the ideal output. If we put an even smaller resistance for the load, like 10 milliohms, our output dips to just over a volt. And of course, if we put a zero ohm resistance out there, which is the equivalent of a wire, we get zero volts at the output. While this may not be a perfect model of a source, it does much more closely reflect the real behavior of a source. If we look at the amount of current being drawn from the source, the voltage we get at the output gets smaller and smaller as the current we draw gets higher and higher. This would explain why headlights dim when we try to start a car. When the car's starter demands a lot of current, the voltage at the terminals of the battery decreases a lower voltage applied to the lights results in less light being emitted. Our conclusion, the model of a voltage source can be made more realistic by adding a series resistor with the ideal voltage source. We also have something called an ideal current source. This is a current source from which we get the same current no matter how much current's drawn from it, no matter what the voltage is across it. This is no more realistic than an ideal voltage source. Let's start with an ideal current source and add a resistance in parallel. If we add a load resistor to this circuit, we can see how much current gets to the load by using current division. Remember, to do current division, we look at the conductance we're interested in divided by the sum of conductances in parallel times the total current seen by the parallel combination. If we analyze this for all the same load resistors, we'll find the load currents will be as follows. If our short-term memory is working properly, these values should look very familiar. They are the same currents we got for the voltage source. Now let's talk this through. We're modeling circuits. We thought we could model a voltage source more accurately by putting a resistance in series with the ideal voltage source. The results seemed reasonable. I then suggested we might improve the model of an ideal current source by putting a resistance in parallel with it. This resulted in a current to the load increasing as we decreased the resistance of a load. This again seems reasonable. What we might not have expected was to get the same exact currents to the load for every resistance, but we did. So if two models produce the same exact results, it's probably safe to say that they are equivalent models. So a voltage source in series with a resistance is equivalent to a current source in parallel with the same resistance. And it's not too hard to see that the relationship between the values of the voltage and the current source is simply Ohm's law. In generalized term, we could write it like this. If we had a current source on the right, we can make the equivalent voltage source on the left by using Ohm's law to calculate the value of the voltage source. And if we had a voltage source on the left, we wanted to represent it as the current source on the right, we again use Ohm's law to determine the value of the current source. Changing between these two representations of the same source is what we call a source transformation. This immediately brings up the very profound question, so what? Well, sometimes it's convenient. We might be looking at a circuit with a current source in parallel with the resistor and realize if it was only a voltage source in series with the resistor, solving for the voltages and currents in the circuit would be much easier. There is another reason, but I won't bring that up until I need to. Now, I'm not a gambler, but I'm willing to bet right now you're thinking, what I need to see right now is a very contrived example of how this might be useful. Was that? It's a good thing I'm not a gambler. You're probably right, but I'm still going to give you a contrived example. 
Hold it. Are those terms redundant? I hate redundant phrases. Be right back. It turns out that contrived and example are not redundant. Something can be an example without ever having been contrived, so contrived is a legitimate adjective modifying example. I'm very relieved to find this out. Moving on. Imagine some instructor somewhere for this circuit asks you to find an expression for VL in terms of RL. In light of the previous comments I made, you probably know that source transformations are going to help us out here. We notice that the left side of the circuit is a voltage source in series with a resistor. From what we just learned, we know that we can make this into a current source in parallel with the resistor. The value of the source using Ohm's law is 15 volts divided by 60 ohms, so that the source can be represented by a quarter amp source in parallel with the 60 ohm resistor. After the transformation, we notice there are three resistors in parallel. We can combine those resistors by adding their conductances. Then the equivalent resistance will be 20 ohms. Looking at the resultant circuit, now the left side is a current source in parallel with the resistance. We can transform them into a voltage source in series with the resistance by determining the voltage using Ohm's law and we get 5 volts. Now our circuit is a single loop. We can use voltage division to write an expression for the load voltage in terms of the load resistor. But, before I leave you, I want to go through a few extra points. First, it is perfectly acceptable to transform a dependent source as long as it is a dependent voltage source in series with the resistor or a dependent current source in parallel with the resistor. The value of the dependent sources will still be related by Ohm's law. So if we had a dependent voltage source of 6VX in series with a 10 ohm resistor and we wanted to transform it into a current source in parallel with the resistor, the value of the dependent current source in the transformed circuit will be 6VX divided by 10 ohms. Just remember, a source transformation cannot eliminate dependence. Another issue that comes up is one in a situation like this. Clearly, this is a voltage source in series with the resistor. In that respect, this voltage source can be transformed. However, transforming this voltage will eliminate the variable Vx. If that is a controlling parameter for a dependent source, or if it happens to be what we're trying to determine, the transformation will render the problem unsolvable. Do not transform controlling parameters or elements that have a current or voltage you're trying to discover. Another point, anytime we do a source transformation, the transformed source must exist between the same two nodes as it did before the transformation. So that this current source, in parallel with the resistor, would transform into this voltage source in series with the resistor, like this. A very common error I see when people are learning about source transformations occurs when there's a current source in parallel with the resistor in the middle of a circuit. Students will often try to transform it by having the voltage source and resistor maintain some sort of traditional shape of a voltage source in series with the resistor, like the 15 volt source and the 60 ohm resistor on the left. This results in an entirely new circuit, so the results we will get will have nothing to do with the original circuit. In other words, they will be junk. If I was able to communicate what I meant to in this video. You now know that a voltage source in series with a resistor can be used interchangeably with a current source in parallel with the resistor, as long as the voltage and current are related by Ohm's law. To go from a current source to a voltage source, the voltage will be a resistance times a current. To go from a voltage to a current source, the current will be voltage divided by resistance. That's all I have for you today. Go out and make it a great one.